Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Obux Presents. Uh, my name is Ben Crabe and I'm really happy today to welcome on one of our best-selling authors. His name is Mike George and he's the author of over 14 books on self-awareness and spiritual intelligence. Um, he's an inspirational speaker who for the last 30 years has been coaching, guiding and facilitating the personal and executive development of people in companies and communities in over 40 countries. In a unique blend of insight, wisdom and humour, Mike brings together the three key strands of the 21st century, self-understanding, emotional intelligence and continuous unlearning. As an inspirational speaker, experience facilitator and meditation teacher, each year he leads a series of awareness retreats worldwide and his books include The Seven Ahas of Highly Enlightened Souls, Don't Get Mad, Get Wise, In the Light of Meditation and his latest book with us, The Seven Myths About Love, Actually. Welcome Mike. Hello. Hi Ben, Hi. thanks for you having me on. No, it's a pleasure. And um, I wanted to talk to you today about love and uh, one of the things we want to do on this channel is make you know, difficult spiritual ideas accessible and easy to understand and love is something you hear about all the time in spirituality people talk about God's love being love expressing love and I wanted to ask you first of all what is love? Um, yeah, it's uh, an age-old question and um, people tend to externalize it and see it something that needs to be acquired or that's required but in reality love is is what each of us is it's what we are it's what I am but only when my consciousness um, is clear and uh, in other words um, only in its highest vibration when there's no um, uh, attachment, there's no ego, there's no negativity in my consciousness, then it's possible to vibrate at the highest level. And and so love is what I am, but I can't know that until I give it away, until I give of myself without wanting anything in return. And of course today, because we've got the habit of not giving, but taking and keeping and wanting, then it's quite difficult to know love as something that I am. And so we go searching for it, and because we just believe we're what we see in the bathroom mirror in the morning, we believe we're just physical beings. So then we kind of believe that love is a kind of physical energy, and therefore it has to come from outside. It has to come from another person. It has to come from outside in. And that's just a huge mistake that everybody makes, basically. And when you believe love has to come from outside in, then you're guaranteed to be disappointed, you're going to be frustrated, and you're always going to be searching, and you're probably always going to be dependent on what you think is giving you a sense of love. So ultimately, it's not something that comes from outside in, it's something that comes from inside out, from within my consciousness. Um, but that's not a new idea, it's an ancient wisdom, basically. I'm just refreshing people's memory in my own way. So, so, so many people, and I hear very often, they're yearning for love or they might be alone in life and they really, really want somebody else or they want love in their life. And what you're saying is maybe the first step to getting the kind of love that they think they need is is to actually not look for someone else at all, it's to look inside themselves first. Yeah, when we're brought up by parents and by teachers and the, the, the big people in our culture, we're taught to believe that um, um, we're responsible for their happiness. In other words, when mum and dad say, if you do what I want, you know, I'll be very happy, but if you don't do what I want, I'll be very unhappy. Mm -hmm. And so when we do what other people want, uh, they seem pleased with us. And so that seeming of being pleased, sometimes it's called approval or acceptance. And the energy that comes from that, it's about as close as we get to love when we're children. And so we're taught as children to be dependent on others for feelings of approval, which we mistake for love. And then if we grow up with that mistake, 
then we start looking for others' approval, others' acceptance, whether it's the boss at work or my partner in life or whatever. And, and so we kind of limit our understanding of love to just approval and acceptance of others. And those become drugs, really. We become dependent on those things. So when we don't get the approval of others, when we don't get the acceptance of others, we, we kind of learn to believe, well, they don't love me. They don't like me. I'm not getting love. And then when I'm not being loved by others and I'm feeling unloved, which is a very common feeling that people generate from inside, and no one loves me, I, I need to go looking, I have to find love. And that's just the perfect receptacle to receive the myth of romantic love, the myth that love happens only between two people um, in a special relationship. And so I look, go looking for that special person. And, uh, and then that just becomes, um, well... I hesitate to use the word mess, but it, it, it makes relationships a little bit messy, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, so so like at school or in my job, um, if someone says, well done, you are great, or well done, that's, that's the kind of ple- love you get from pleasing people. But what you're talking about, spiritual love or the highest form of love, um, that's not it. And the same when someone in a relationship is saying I love you and like, that's not quite it either. Um, when someone says I love you, um, um, it usually means I want you or I'd like to be with you, or I'd like to possess you. Uh, I'm not saying that's the case all the time, but that's what it tends to mean. This is the, the myth of romantic love when he says to her, darling, I love you. And very often he means I want you uh, or I'm possessing you. And so this is not real love. I think everyone kind of understands that the ultimate definition of love is, is unconditional. It's an unconditional energy. Yeah. In other words, if you don't do what I would like you to do, or you don't be the way I want you to be, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to be here for you. So in the movie, if, if there was an accurate understanding of love, then the script would not read, um, I love you. It would read something more like, I am love for you. Mm. <laughs> but of course, that would put Hollywood out of business yeah. because everyone's kind of addicted to the romantic idea of what love is, that it comes from this one other special person, usually of the opposite physical gender. Mm. Um, and so if, if true love was going to be expressed and shared in that situation, it would be, I am love for you. And this is what happens when we're children. Um, there's this great myth around um, children need to be loved and it's very difficult to shift that from our consciousness because it's kind of been programmed in since we were very young and it's not that I as a as a child I need to be loved as a child I need to see how to be love and there's a big difference because when the parent believes you need to be loved my child and I'm going to be the one to give you that love and exclusively my love is special just for you then the child learns to believe that love comes from outside in and that love comes from the authority figure in my life and so we carry that belief into the rest of our life and we never really learn that actually love is what I am and love is what I can be for others in any situation so it's kind of a disempowering belief that we learn at a very young age and it kind of cripples our, our growth from that point onwards. Uh, can I take the example of children? Yeah, you say um, what they need to learn is I need to see how to be loved. I think, not quite how you said it, but almost how you said it. Yes. Uh, and um, that people feel happy around children, inspired around children, because maybe children are a bit better at being loved than most of us are. are. So maybe a child is, to someone who maybe is at home thinking, I'm miserable, how can, I'm not loved, when, how can I be loved when I'm feeling miserable, is maybe thinking about how a child is quite a good way to to get in touch with this idea that I am love? Well, at the very youngest age, the child is in a kind of innocent state of consciousness. 
Mm. So they're in a natural, they're in their natural state. They haven't yet been conditioned or programmed, and mm. they haven't grown up um, into grown-up clothes and culture yet. Mm. So they're still at, at that at that state of a kind of a pure consciousness. Mm. That's why there's a natural joy, there's a natural lovefulness in the nature of many children. Mm. Um, and so um, what happens is that that gets programmed out because the parent teaches the child that if you do what I want, I'll be happy. If you don't, I'll be unhappy. Mm. And so the child gradually learns to believe that to win the parent's approval, which is what they mistake for love, they have to do what they're told. And if they don't do what they're told, then the parent becomes unhappy. And so the child learns that love is both a happy state and an unhappy state. <laughs> yeah. which is kind of fatal really because you can't be loving or love fool when you're unhappy and so it all becomes um, increasingly confusing as we kind of grow up through our childhood etc but it all comes back to one basic mistake and it's just this understanding this belief that I'm just what I see in the bathroom mirror in the morning and this is the material paradigm this is the 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 belief that I'm just a physical entity and if you believe you're just a physical entity then you believe that your happiness your love your joy has to come through your physical senses and the physical senses are designed to consume the world to bring the world from outside in so you believe that love and peace and joy they come from outside in and so we don't learn no one teaches us because they don't know that actually love and peace and joy and these are natural states of being but that I can only know them, I can only feel them when I express them, when I bring them from inside out. Mm -hmm. But if I'm busy in my life trying to bring the world, people, stimulations from outside in, I never learn to bring myself from inside out. I never learn to be my natural self. And so it's like right from the very get-go, if you like, mm -hmm. um, we're kind of running uphill, we're pushing a boulder uphill. Um, but that's the way it is. It's okay. That's just the way it's turned out. But this is why there's so much suffering, so much mm -hmm. sorrow, so much stress, so much unhappiness in the world today. And so what you're saying a lot is you're saying how we've been conditioned to think of love in many different ways. And what you're outlining is what love yep. is, isn't, what it's not. And that's what you do in the book. You um, talk about the seven myths about love. and In a sense, yeah. yeah and um, th these are maybe stories that we've been conditioned to believe as you're saying and, but you're also pointing out that there's a natural love a natural well-being that's you know our inner part of our inner consciousness mm. and what how do you work or what's your favorite way yeah. of helping people who may be lost sight of love or who are desperately looking for it in perhaps approval as you mentioned or a relationship as you mentioned how do you like to guide people to actually get back inside which is where you want them to look um, I think basically by reminding them of what they already know what we all already know we know deep down that it's natural to be loving to be joyful to be happy we know this deep down and so um, it's something that can never be lost and so, I mean, if I asked you or if when I asked people, have you ever been happy for absolutely no reason? Mm -hmm. Have you ever wanted to care for someone um, for absolutely no reason, just, just for the sake of caring? Have you ever felt very deeply and peacefully content inside yourself mm -hmm. and there's no apparent reason? Mm -hmm. And most people say, yeah, I, I do and I have. And, mm -hmm. and it's usually been short moments in their life. But these are the moments um, when you're actually abiding in your true spiritual nature. When I use the word spiritual, I don't mean some spiritualism or spiritual mysticism. I just mean that's what you are. Spiritual energy is what consciousness is. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so my job is not to, I'm not teaching really. I'm just pointing at this. I'm putting up signposts and saying, look, it's already there. And I'm sure at least once a year you've gone to a department store and bought a beautiful gift and taken it to someone in your life and you said, this is from me to you with a lot of love. Mm. And then the question is, well, where does the love come from? It doesn't come from the department store. It's not in the gift, not in the wrapping. It comes from the heart of our being. Mm. 
Mm. And in that moment, we remind ourselves that actually in that moment, I am love. It's not something separate. And so it, it is me. Mm. And so it's kind of reminding, oh, yeah, that is me. Oh, wait a minute. And so wait a minute. The final question is, well, why am I not feeling loving? Why am I not feeling happy? Why am I not feeling at peace all the time? And there's one very simple reason. We're all carrying a virus, and, and beliefs are viruses, really. We're carrying a virus in our consciousness which says, if you want to feel, to know love and happiness, you have to go and get something, get someone, get somewhere, get on in your life. Mm. But the reality is, the truth is, if you want to feel these things, don't get, give. Because when you give the gift with love, who feels it first on the way out? I do, you do. And so that's a demonstration. And people go, yeah, I get that. That's true, actually. Well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe I need to start doing more of that. So, so you'd recommend, say, <laughs> sponge, you know, as the practice of giving in a way. As, you know, just, and giving to me doesn't necessarily mean buying a gift, although it can mean buying a beautiful gift out of the goodness of your heart, but also just paying a compliment when you feel, you know, when their compliment is there to be paid or or being kind when you have an opportunity to be kind, would you say? Yeah, that's it. Mm. Love has many expressions, many faces. It's empathy, it's kindness, it's forgiveness, it's caring, it's sharing. There's so many expressions of it, but it's the intention that is the key. And as long as the intention is free of wanting anything in return, mm. then the energy is, is pure, if you like. The intention is the highest that consciousness can express. And um, one of your myths is is connected to all this, which is love hurts. Because I, I certainly know people who equate <laughs> yes. love with meaning pain, basically. <laughs> and um, and to think that if we if we love someone, then we will suffer in some way. But you're, you're talking about a st you know you, yeah. That's, that's not what you're talking about here, is it? Well, if there's any suffering, then it means that it's not love in a sense. Yeah. Um, it's uh, suffering is by definition unhappiness. It's unlovingness. Mm. And so it's not love if, if there is suffering. You cannot be loveful or loving if you are um, suffering in any way. And then I make the distinction here between pain and suffering. Pain is physical. Suffering is mental and emotional. And while pain is compulsory, it's bound to happen. Some stage your body's going to experience some pain. Uh, suffering is optional because it's mental and emotional. It's entirely my choice. It's my creation. Mm -hmm. And that's quite hard for people because we grow up with the belief that other people, other situations, events make me suffer, make me emote, emotional in this way. Mm -hmm. And so no one teaches us actually that our feelings, our emotions and our feelings our thoughts are entirely 100% my responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't take responsibility for them, and I believe mm -hmm. someone else is making me suffer, I can't be loving towards them, I can't be caring, I can't share, I can't connect with them if I'm in that state of emotional sorrow in my relationship with them. So it's, it's about taking responsibility first. That's the first step, really, mm -hmm. is seeing that I'm responsible for my feelings and if I'm hurt in any way some people they say you hurt my feelings no you didn't I created hurt feelings and so it's about understanding how and why I keep creating those hurt feelings because if I don't see why I can't free myself from it I can't liberate myself from my own self-created hurtfulness if I can't do that I can't love uh, yeah, we all we all um, uh, feel those hurt feelings and let's blame you know the other person. And we've all been through that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, in a way, is what you I say. Think so. In in your bio, you you're teaching unlearning. So what in a way what you're what you're pointing out is um, what uh, unlearning by making us aware of all the learnt habits that we've created that um, that are, aren't serving us, a bit, yeah. like, a bit like the one you just brought up. It, would you say that's your main 
it's how you work in your books and your main way, right. main way of teaching is is giving people the ability to to then become conscious of how this is all playing out in their own lives. Um, it's not so much giving. I can't actually give you that, but I can uh, help you to see that for yourself. I mean, and that's really what I, I'm doing. Yeah. As I say, putting up signposts, uh, using examples, trying to help you see the first step is, is self-awareness. And, and from self-awareness comes self-understanding. Mm. From self-understanding comes self-responsibility. Oh, wait a minute. It's me that's making me feel like this. Mm. So the question then is not how can I be happy? The question then is why am I not happy now? Mm. And so that makes me inquire. What am I putting in the way of my own nature, my own natural state of happiness? What am I doing that's sabotaging that? Mm. And so when you see what you're doing, only then can you stop doing it. Can you unlearn it? Because you learned it. That's what we all do. We all learn to sabotage ourselves, to put something in the way of our nature. So if we learned it, it means we can unlearn it. And at the core of the learning is our beliefs, our belief systems. These are why beliefs are sleeping pills for the soul. They keep us asleep. And, and of course, those beliefs are affirmed by the world around us. The world of advertising and marketing, it's their job to keep us asleep in our belief system so that they can tap it, touch it, exploit it, and make us act from it. And, and we don't realize, actually, it's our beliefs that it's causing our inability to be content, to be happy, to be loving, to be at peace within ourselves. So it's a process, and it's different for each one. I like, I like that. Beliefs are sleeping pills for the soul. Is it in your retreats, and awareness retreats, or is there yeah. any... Are you, are you the type of speaker who kind of likes, who recommends a practice, or are you are you working mainly on a mind level, allowing people to start discerning, you know, what's conditioned and what's unconditioned inside them? How do you like to work yourself? It's a combination, really. It's a combination, and all, and it has to be of of. Um, feeding of this kind of information I'm sharing with you now, yeah. then very practical, simple, personal exercises to see for yourself. Yeah. Uh, because if you just do it on an information level, I'm, then I'd be saying, just believe what I'm saying. But I actually have to say, please don't believe what I'm saying, mm. but use it as a signpost for yourself. And, and that's what I'm saying. If you look this way, if you look that way, if you look there, then you will see for yourself what you need to do mm. to wake yourself up, to change yourself. I can't do that. No one can do that for you. Books don't do it. Mm. Seminars, gurus don't do it. They might act as triggers. They might awaken some inspiration from inside out within you. But they don't actually change you. You actually do that. So the retreats, the courses, the seminars are a kind of combination of, of information, practical exercises, Q&A, but most importantly, meditation, because in the state of meditation, you reconnected with your nature, with your power, um, below the layers of beliefs at the core of your being is your power, is your true nature. And so meditation allows you to access that, to, to clear away the memories, the experiences, the recorded feelings, the recorded beliefs, and, and go down like drilling for oil and to touch that power. And so to bring that power, that awareness back into the reality of your day-to-day -day life. So it's a combination of, of different things, basically, as it has to be, in my experience. And that connects with what you said at the beginning of this conversation, which is um, love or real love or spiritual love or true love is, is the same thing as being connected with the core of your being, which, which is what we do when we do med meditation it's the two yeah the two are the same thing yeah. Uh, yeah. and yep is there any kind of meditation practice that you particularly like doing is it a particular style of meditation or is it your own style um i mean there's many approaches to meditation out there in the world now and if you mm. consult dr google uh, you, you'll get a hundred different ways to sit and meditate. And I usually say to people, you know, you have to find the way that kind of works for you at this moment and then adapt it and, and, and play with it 
until maybe one day it doesn't work and you have to add something to it or take something away from it. For example, the past few, I think, 10 years, we've seen the explosion of mindfulness as a, as a way of meditation, which is really um, uh, a code for present moment awareness. It allows you to learn to be less absent, less lost in past thoughts and less lost in future speculations and to be fully present in the moment now. Um, but mindfulness is not enough. It's a great practice, but the next stage is to actually move yourself into something called self-realization. And that requires a little bit of input from the outside. Like I was sharing earlier, you're not what you see in the bathroom mirror. You're a spiritual being. There's a being of consciousness which is animating the form you see in the mirror. And that being, that energy, that spiritual energy, is what we are, it's what I am. Nothing mystical. And so in meditation, I'm going to be that. Um, I'm kind of cultivating the awareness of being spirit, being soul, being consciousness itself. Yeah, so, so when you are being yourself, then your true nature gets to come from inside out. Yeah, then peace is natural. Then to give and to care and to forgive is natural. You don't think about it. You just do it naturally. Yeah. And so meditation is, 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 is very much a personal approach, depending on where you're at at this point in time. Uh, find what works for you, explore, and then gradually you'll get to a level, oh, I need to go a bit deeper here, and then something's missing in my meditation. Okay, there's something else I need to do. So it's a kind of progressive approach. And, and I'm not going to say there's one right way, like anything. It's what's best for you at this point in your life right now. I hear you. So you find the right fit. Um, and yeah, when, when I've you know, med so we're using meditation to go deeper into who we really are, the consciousness within the body. And when I first started reading about these, these kind of concepts or these kind of pointers, rather, my mind would say, well, what is this all about? Trying to picture it trying to imagine what what you know, the experience of meditation should be like yeah. but for someone who's starting out here yeah. would you say it's good to think back to your earlier example of thinking about times where you felt happy for no reason at all because in a way that's that's it or that's the entry point into it isn't it um in a sense it, it it's uh it's a good way to help you to remember that that's possible, that you don't need to be dependent on anything or on an external level to feel like that internally. And so, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a good starting point. And, and in, in meditation itself, the secret, however, is, is to have no expectations. You know, we live in the age of expectation. We expect instant results, instant feedback. And many people, when they sit and meditate, and, 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 and they expect to feel very deeply peaceful and uh, enlightened in almost, you know, one hour. And then when, because that's what it said in chapter five in the book, then when nothing happens, they go, oh, wait a minute, it's not working or it's not for me, I didn't feel anything, and so on. And so the thing with meditation is when nothing happens, actually that's what's meant to happen uh, for some people, is that nothing happens and then you wonder, I'm feeling uncomfortable because I didn't get what I expected. And so if that's making you inquire into your own consciousness, then meditation has had its purpose. So sometimes you'll get nothing happening and you go, wait a minute, what's happening? Sometimes uh, feelings will arise from deep memories that are not so pleasant. And that's okay because that's teaching you to let the feeling come, let the memory emerge and then let it go. Let it come and let it go. Let it come and let it go. So now you are having power over your memories. You are the master of the feeling instead of it flooding you. And so meditation teaches you that. And sometimes in meditation, you will go into a completely deep, silent, still space yeah, where nothing is moving and you feel totally unlimiting. And so that's maybe the deepest level of meditation. And so you will also come out of that thinking, maybe, I feel... I don't know why, I feel absolutely marvelous. I feel refreshed and renewed. Mm. Yeah? 
um, but you don't know why. Um, and so you just go, oh, hey, that, that really was working for me. And then you start carrying on with your activities, but you carry on with those activities with a new energy, a refresh, refocused energy, and so you notice there's a difference. And then you really measure how meditation is working for you. So the secret is have no expectations. Never compare your experience with anyone else. And, um, and <laughs> perhaps most of all, never try to repeat an experience. You know, if you have a good experience in meditation, that was then. This is now. And so don't try and repeat it because you'll be frustrated. Every moment is different. That's just the way things have been designed. And we want to do that about everything, don't we? <laughs> repeat a holiday, repeat a date, repeat a night out. We always want to try and repeat it. And, you can't know, do it. Yeah. You can't. <laughs> yeah. That's right, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. That's a super clear and vivid description of, of um, meditation. I just wondered if uh, what you're up to at the moment where people can find you, where you're working, if you've got any upcoming retreats. And I think, I think you've got a new website as well. Yeah, there's a new website going up with all the books on it um, called um, MikeGeorgeBooks.com. Mm -hmm. And that'll be up in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, if people have questions, if they want to connect with me personally mm -hmm. directly, I'm always happy to answer any questions. And so the email for that is mike at relax7.com. Mike at relax7, as in the number 7, dot com. Fantastic, Mike. Thank you so much for taking the time um, for coming on Obooks Presents. And I wish you the very best in the future. Pleasure. Thanks. Nice talking to you, Ben. Take care.